All righty. So thanks for joining. Um, I am Sharice Arrowood. I am the Senior Director of Unicon's Identity Practice. Um, today, I am joined with Mike Grady, Jonathan Johnson, and Paul Spotty, who are all identity specialists with Unicon. We're here to talk about the National Institute of Health MFA requirements, but more than that, what we're really here to do is to help you to understand what you need to do to meet those requirements. So today is really about you. We're going to have a very short, straightforward presentation to talk about different aspects of updates that might work for you, and then we're going to open it up for your questions. So uh, please go ahead and start using the chat if you want to fill specific questions in that you have, especially as we go through the bits and pieces of the presentation. Um, at the end of this, we'll stop sharing and then we will address as many questions as we can based on um, the time that we have. So again, thanks for joining. Um, the one other thing that I did want to mention, and we'll talk about it just a little bit later, is there some people might be interested in kind of what we're referring to as the next steps regarding NIH um, compliance, and there will be later discussions that Unicon will assist with at that time. We're just focusing on that September 15th deadline, and that's what you're going to hear from the team today, so regarding really the released attributes and the MFA. With that said, I'm going to hand it over to Mike Grady. Hello, uh, Mike Grady. I am architect with Unicon. The, the first question you really need to ask is, are you releasing attributes today to the NIH gateway? If you're not, then you're not going to be impact. Nothing's going to change for you on September 15th. Your IDP cannot be being used today by any of your researchers, anyone at your institution for NIH unless you're releasing those uh, core set of attributes, uh, uh, an identifier, name, uh, uh, an email, um, and, and maybe edge person scope affiliation to the NIH gateway. So how would you know in case you're not aware? Um, of course, you, can, you could also check your activity logs to see if you're sending anything to NIH, but how would you know if your IDP could be used for NIH today? So. You, you can look for, the, you know, look in your attribute filter file. If you're released to, to be releasing to NIH, you'd have to have one, one of the following three things or a variation on the first one. You, you, you'd have to have a release rule in your filter file that's releasing a, a core set of attributes to any in common registered SP or potentially any SP that you get metadata for through the in common uh, metadata feed. Or you'd have to be releasing attributes to any federation designated RNS service. Um, and, and I have little snippets of the type of policy requirement rule you would have in your attribute filter file that, that you know, would be doing this, right? So for like RNS, you'd be looking for the entity attribute to be in that metadata that says it's been designated by a federation as being a qualified to be considered a research and scholarship service. Um, or Finally, you'd have to be releasing attributes, at least specifically, to the NIH ERA gateway, which is that uh, uh, requester ID that I have listed there. Um, any one of those is okay for releasing the attributes to NIH. NIH is not actually checking to see that you've registered your IDP to be as being compliant with RNS. They're basically looking to get the attributes that the RNS bundle would provide them. Um, so, assuming that you're releasing the attributes, and I guess the other thing I'll say about that is, if you aren't releasing attributes now to NIH, then you know that you're, you know, nobody, nobody's access to NIH that your institution is going to break because they can't be using your IDP for that today. They must, if you have people going to NIH, they must be using a login.gov provisioned account which remains a possibility. Researchers can get individual login.gov accounts to access these NIH services like the Electronics Research Administration, the ERA gateway. Um, uh, but if you, um, and if you aren't doing that now, of course, in common would really like you to be, right? In common really wants every uh, identity provider to be releasing the RNS bundle to any service tagged as RNS. And it's possible at some point in the future, 
that in common could even make that a baseline expectation. It isn't today, but they, they strongly encourage everyone to do it. So if you aren't doing it today, again, this would be a good time to consider doing it, but you're not gonna be impacted on September 15th. So let's assume you are releasing the attributes or you're gonna put that in place. Then the other requirement is the MFA configuration. So for most people running the SHIB IDP, that would be using the MFA flow that you're using the MFA flow that you have duo and you've configured duo into your IDP and that you've associated the particular auth and context class ref that refeds MFA defines that HTTPS refeds.org profile slash MFA. You've associated that with both the authn duo and authn mfa flows in either your general authn xml file or in authn properties if you happen to have installed 4.1 and moved to the new model in 4.1 of, of of removing some of those auth, uh, xml files like general authn and instead you specify everything in a properties file um, but th those are the the bottom line things that you would need to do to tell your idp that if the user does duo, it satisfies refeds MFA and that the IDP can can honestly respond back to NIH that you've done, you know, you've you, you've met the requirement of having done the multi-factor authentication that refeds MFA says you've done. We move on to the next. So the other possibility, if, if you're not, if you don't have authentication being done by your IDP, but you're delegating authentication from your IDP to Azure AD, which became a uh, you know, fairly easy option as of SHIB IDP4 to delegate authentication to another SAML IDP, uh, then what you need to do for Azure AD specifically is documented in the SHIB wiki at, at the link that we have in the slide. Um, Chris Phillips and the Canadian Access Federation wrote up a really nice guideline for configuring your IDP to defer authentication to Azure AD. And one of the optional tasks it lists is how you, you, you set it up to, to qualify, you know, to satisfy refeds MFA. If you're delegating authentication to some other SAML IDP service, well, then you can talk to Unicon uh, and we can, we can help if you need help. Uh, Azure AD has been the, uh, the, the, the most frequent uh, uh, IDP we've, 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 we've seen that people are delegating to, but if you're delegating to Okta or SecureAuth or others, we can help you if you, if you need that help um, with those. Uh, but there's no document to point you to uh, in, in, as there is for the Azure AD use case. Um, and then once you've done the work, you, what you do besides the duo and the MFA is you check your um, uh, in your MFA authn config the logic if you if you use M the second factor script example that's in the provided MFA authn config file that comes with the SHIB IDP it's already has logic in it that would cause the user to get sent to do duo if a service specifically asks for refeds MFA. So that's the other piece of the MFA config is the logic that you have in MFA authentic config. And that's where we can give you just, you know, everybody has changed that logic in different ways. So we'd have to look at each individual case to be able to help any, any one of you to know exactly what change, if any, you, you'd need to make to that file um, to this script that you have in there to ensure that refeds MFA gets invoked when it needs to. Um, and then uh, when you've done that work, you can verify with the NIH compliance tool that MFA has happened. Um, one thing that will though will look for and, and complain about that you don't actually need to worry about September 15th is about edge person assurance. So the compliance tool has been written to to both check for the requirements that are gonna be in place September 15th, but also for additional requirements that are going to come into play sometime in the next couple of years around institutions doing identity assurance and, and asserting in an attribute what level of assurance the particular identity that you're sending attributes about has been vetted to be at. 
Um, but you can ignore the whole thing about assurance and edge person assurance for now. And that's something that we'll say, we'll, we'll have a future webinar on that, that, that That's quite an effort because that involves how you manage identities, how you onboard identities, how you manage credentials. If there's a lot about how your business processes are done. Um, so as I say, that's a, a subject for, for multiple webinars in the future. Thank you, Mike. All right, let's have Paul talk to you about CAS. All right, so the Aperio CAS SSO server also has this ability. Um, it roughly follows the path that Shibboleth IDP we just talked about. So I'll go over this a little bit quicker. Uh, you need a relatively recent Aperio CAS ver server version. Um, technically, you can go all the way back to 5.1. Uh, but I would really say, or Unic, I'd really suggest 6.3 or newer, you know, some of the supported community versions uh, would be, be a lot better. Um, as we know, it's worked, it works and we've, and we've done it. Um, so you configure MFA like you would for anything else with the, with the duo and, and triggering it how you want. And it ends up being the, the, the big, the, 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 the only configuration that you might need once you consider all these other things, which I'll go through here in a second, is just a CAS property. And that CAS property down here, the context class mappings maps the, the refeds MFA profile to a particular uh, MFA provider that you've set up in CAS, which this is the generic default, which is MFA-duo. So considering that you have duo provided, uh, when the SAML2 authentic uh, authentication request comes in and it sees that refeds MFA, it will take you to duo and, and assert that duo is done. Um, so that's kind of the magic there, just requires one CAS property change. This is the format for 6.3 or newer, um, partly 6.2. Um, you would have to camel case that uh, uh, authentication context class mappings. So do check the docs for your CAS server version because the configuration might change a little bit. Um, but besides setting up Duo, uh, having your CAS server set up as a SAML2 identity provider, um, as Mike said for Shibboleth, IDP, you need to configure uh, the, the certain NIH services or all of in common in your CAS service registry. Uh, if you do not have that today, you don't have in common or you don't have any of the NIH services uh, in any of the service definitions, then you do not need to worry about this as Mike said, because you are not releasing these attributes, you are not allowing people to log into these applications. Um, if you do release to these services and you haven't set it up already, there are there is a specific bundle of attributes that needs to be released. Um, there is a specific CAS um, attribute release policy for the research and scholarship bundle, uh, so you could use that. And it's often chained uh, with the the EduPerson targeted ID salt and also some of the in common bundle. Uh, we have examples of how to do that. We can help you through that. Um, otherwise, you can just do a map to tribute release and, and, and do it that way if that's the way you've done it. But you do need release the attributes, so you can't forget about them. But other than that, the only change is this uh, CAS property at the bottom there. And that's it. Thank you, Paul. All right, let's move on to JJ and he's gonna talk about Simple SAML PHP. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. The great thing about being the last speaker is everyone's already said everything that needs to be said, or at least a lot of what needs to be said. So I get to skip over some of that and just talk a little bit specific about Simple SAML PHP. Of course, if you're running Simple SAML PHP, you've decided upon what mode you're running this uh, th this particular IDP in, and there are there are different requirements, different steps that you might have to go through depending upon what mode you're in. If you're running your Simple SAML PHP as just an IDP and not delegating off, you will require to set up MFA and some local attribute release configuration. Now what's tricky about Simple SAML PHP is there are a lot of community modules out there. There are some catalog modules. There are some out there in GitHub and all of them work differently uh, in triggering your MFA. But generally speaking there, it is typically an auth proc that happens that would look at your authentication context class ref and then push you off onto another view based upon that. 
And it being PHP, it's a little bit easier to get in there and do live updates. So you get that going for you as well. If you're running your simple SIML PHP as a proxy, you will need to set up your IDP to send that authentication context class ref back to your delegated IEP. That's very similar to what Mike mentioned earlier with setting up Azure AD with Shibboleth. The trick, the trick there is that you have if you needed to map it to, for instance, the Azure AD, it's not going to be a straight proxying of that, you would have to have some sort of translation out there. If you were just doing a straight pass, there is a proxy patch out there. You can see the reference there in the lower right-hand corner from the RefEd's website. And they talk about a not, not a huge patch that you would have to apply to get that proxy of the, the authentication context class ref. The other bit as well, as has been mentioned, you will need to go out there and configure the RNS bundle. Typically, you would just do that in your remote SP uh, metadata file, or you could do it globally based upon <clears throat> the entity attributes out there or the source of the metadata. That said, that said if we can go on to the next slide there, Sharice, uh, something else that we run ourselves is an IDP proxy. Uh, we call it the, our Federation Gateway. It provides a multi-entity metadata exchange to establish relationships between SAML IDPs and SPs. Or for short, it's a SAML2 proxy. We will be shortly updating, making sure that our Federation Gateway does support the proxying of that ACCR. And we will be supporting, again, the Azure AD MFA for any of those clients that are interested in using Azure AD as their backing IDP. Thank you, JJ. I just wanted to note as well, so this is actually a, a hosted service that we provide um, and we fully manage for you. Thank you. Uh, so just a little bit before we get to those questions, um, as has been mentioned throughout the session today, we plan on doing several of these. Uh, we all know that there is additional NIH requirements that will be coming down the road and we'll be doing this type of session. We're interested in your feedback, uh, but it looks like we got some initial really good uh, response to some of the Q&A just getting to the point and helping you with next steps. Obviously, if you have things that are a little bit more complex or you want hands-on consulting, Unicon can always help. Reach out to sales at unicon.net. The other item I really wanted to mention, I'm sure a lot of you have noticed that many government branches are ranking security very high on their priority list from many perspectives. We're really focusing in on those branches where higher education will be affected. And as that comes down and is something that really needs to to require updates in configuration, we will also um, provide additional content on our website, as well as possibly hold additional webinars to help you through those. All right, so with that said, we're gonna go into the question and answer portion. I'm going to stop sharing and we're gonna see what we've got so far. All right, so let's see uh, the first one. Do we have an example site that is RNS and requires MFA? You want to talk well, that's to that. the NIH compliance tool. So there's only two, at least in the US right now, there's only two services I'm aware of that explicitly send the in the auth then request from the SP to the IDP, send the refeds MFA as the requested auth then context. And that's if you're using the in common certificate service and you're administrator of that, that's been sending refeds MFA now for uh, several years, I think, at, at least the last year or two. And, and then the next one is going to be NIH. You know, there may be others, but I haven't run across them. So as I say, the simple thing is, is use that NIH compliance check tool that we had the link to in the previous slide. And Sharice, you're going to make the, the slides available somewhere publicly? Yeah, all the slides um, will be on the Unicon website. Okay. Um, 
So that link, or it would be in the email you've been getting from in common. And I think that email has had the NIH compliance check link, uh, compliance checker tool link in it now, uh, the email they've been sending out about, the, about these upcoming requirements. Um, of course, you could jury rig it yourself, right? You could take, if you're running your own SP, uh, like the Shibleth SP, you could configure it to send that authent context class ref, or you can compose an authent request by hand. Um, you uh, you know you can take an authent request and modify it however you need to. Of course, you better modify the timestamp so that it's within three minutes of now. And you can use some online tools that will uh, deflate and encode the XML and then encode the URL and 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 send a. Uh, a redirect auth end request just so that the service is sent, but with refeds MFA as the requested auth end context class. So you could do it that way, but you know the easiest thing is use the uh, NIH compliance tool checker. Excellent, thanks, Mike. And there's Paul posted a few uh, links as well for reference, so you might want to check that out. Uh, let's see, uh, we've got another one. If using SHIB CAS Authen, is this the correct resource? If you guys can just take a look over there at the GitHub uh, link that Jonathan Taylor has posted and respond to that. Yeah, I can probably take that one since I've been Thanks, Paul. With it. Yeah, I've been working with SHIB CAS Authen lately. Um, that is the correct link, and that is the latest correct documentation. Uh, that should work for Shibboleth versions 3, 4, uh, X, 40X, 41X, um, and uh, hopefully in the future as well, but we'll, we'll keep on top of it for you uh, and make new releases as needed. But uh, that should be up to date for the relatively recent versions of the IDP. Thanks, Excellent. Paul. Thanks, Paul. Uh, let's see. Uh, thank you, Dwight from the University of California, Riverside. He was proactive and sent us a question in with his registration. Let's see. He said, most of our staff and faculty use login.gov. It seems as if this bypasses the need to worry about the requirement. And that's correct. I don't know, team, if you have anything else that you want to add to that. Yeah, that is correct. That just means, right, you're, and that's been an option for NIH for well, however long login.gov has been around, there, there always was a, a way to get accounts specific to NIH. They, you know, at some point they moved to be the login.gov accounts, but prior to NIH supporting federated access, they always had a way for people to log in. You just had an NIH specific or you know, fed, fed specific account. And that continues to be true today and that will continue to be true tomorrow. So yeah, one, work around today if you can't get your IDP ready and, and your folks are using it today is tell them to get login.gov accounts until and then I think if you go to to the material that's provided there's something about how they could link that identity to their institutional identity at whatever point in time you are ready to have your IDP meet the NIH requirement. So if they have a login.gov account then you get your IDP ready to be able to satisfy the NIH requirements, get, get that in place. Um, and then there's, a, uh, there's a way then they can link those two identities so that they can switch to using their institutional identity, but not lose, of course, any of their history under the login.gov account that's associated with the login.gov account. Great, thanks, Mike. Uh, let's see, I've got another one. It looks like from Mohammed at Columbia University. Thank you again for being proactive. It looks like he is reaching into the future. So I'll just kind of restate. Um, is there any finalized requirements for the EduPersion assurance level from NIH? What will be the impact for the assurance level for NIH functionality? So that's like what we're kind of referring to as a phase two or next steps uh, that we will be providing a session around across the board. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, if you look at the in common materials on NIH assurance, it talks about that one should expect that if not before that, by 2022 to 2023, some of the NIH services will start looking for various levels of assurance. Some may require a higher level of assurance than others. I, I don't know that I don't know that there's anything finalized about that. The bottom line is, as an institution, you need to start thinking about it and looking at it because it is going to come, um, and it's probably going to come in the form of, you know, federal government services first. NIH is starting it, but one should expect that it's not unlikely that NSF, uh, you know, other big granting agencies in the federal government, like NSF, et cetera, 
might start requiring that also. And, um, you know, certainly uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, has been pushing for MFA and broad use of MFA now for, for a number of years. Um, so, you know, one should expect that that is going to become increasingly important, and it's not something you can do in a day. It's, it's not something you can do in a couple of months, probably, either. I mean, uh, you have to look at all your business processes around how a new employee gets added, that the I-9 has not only been done, but it's recorded that it's been done, that you have a good way that you bind the password to that identity at the time that happens, so you really know the person who set that password is the person who was I-9 vetted, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into assurance. So it's uh, uh, something that's gonna touch a lot of offices across, it's not just gonna be your identity management team, it's gonna across a lot of offices that deal with onboarding individuals at your institution. So that's why you wanna start thinking about it now because it's going to take you, you know, you, you may need to budget money for it and it's gonna take you quite a while. And we'll as I say, we'll do future information sharing on it. Excellent, thank you, Mike. Um, I just also wanted to mention, look, uh, Michael Hodges put in a, a very good note there. Remember, you know, these are open source products, but, you know, he said if we would have known in advance the oldest working versions of SHIB, SHIB, CAS, Authn, and CAS required for asserting MFA, we would have known our SHIB version would not work and obviously be able to upgrade in time for the NIH deadlines. Um, yet yeah, point understood and taken definitely. Um, and we do our best to, from a Unicom perspective when we find out about these things to help in um, you know, the community with the uh, content and communication out, but very good note and well taken, thank you. Well, and, but there's, you know, there's another point you should consider with that. So yes, there is that proactive communication, but think about baseline expectations too, that that everybody that's a member of InCommon is supposed to be in compliance with as of July 15th. Now, InCommon recognizes that there's still a lot of institutions that aren't fully in com compliance and, you know, um, will continue through the calendar year, I imagine, to, you know, to keep bugging people, but not actually doing anything active about, you know, removing the metadata from the from the, but if, if you look at baseline expectations too, it says you're supposed to be in compliance with certify. And if you look at certify, it says you're supposed to be running modern secure software. So there is an argument to be made that if you are on older versions of CAS, you're on older versions of the SHIB software that are, that are past end of life, that you, know, um, you, know, you can look at it one way or another. Are you really in compliance with certify if you are running those versions? So there are other reasons why those versions need to be upgraded to be in compliance with other in common requirements than just whether it has the needed machinery to satisfy um, refeds MFA. Thank you, Mike. Good points. All right, open forum. Feel free to go ahead and unmute and ask a question directly if you like, or you can type further into chat. And if anybody you know, needs help, hands-on help with configuration, you know, you're welcome to share, you know, you can share screen here if you want to bring up like, you, you know, you, you don't know if, if you need to do something to your MFA auth and config or where you need to add the refeds MFA assurance value into your IDP config, for example, or CAS config or whatever. So, you know, we're happy for someone to share their specific copy of a config file if, if they want to do that and, and talk about whether any changes would be needed there or where, where you'd need to make the change. Paul, you want to go ahead and share a little bit more? Oh, yeah, I just, I, I didn't put anything in my slides about delegating. And I, and I know Mike talked about it in Shibboleth and I think JJ and the simple sample PHP. CAS can delegate as well. Um, it has a different environment, of course, and how it does it. Uh, you can actually go to a lot of different, um, different, uh, different uh, identity providers. Um, so it may not always be possible. Um, you may have to assert MFA inside of CAS, but uh, or in your CAS. Uh, but um, if it is possible, Unicon can help you. And I posted a link to the recent CAS properties. There's some properties to help if CAS doesn't just do it already, but we'll help you through that. Wonderful, thank you. Has anybody here run the compliance tool and 
gotten back warning messages other than about edge person assurance? I can say yes to that. Yeah, I'd have to, you know, in the case, you know, the, uh, the service requesting the authentic context class is, is simpler than what most institutions have already done in terms of modifying the MFA logic to be institutionally driven, right? Where you're making decisions, okay, if the person's in this group or the person has this affiliation and the service is X or Y or Z, then they need need to do MFA, but if the service is B, we don't want to make them, you know, we don't care whether they otherwise do MFA or not. Like sometimes institutions will exempt the learning management system from MFA, even if, if, if all other services are covered, because, you know, they're worried that a student could be taking a test and not, you know, and not supposed to have access to their phone and the phone is their second factor. So they can't very well do MFA to take that test in the learning management system if they're not allowed to have their phone with them, right? So, you know, th that is the, the sort of thing that you end up having to make, you know, uh, more significant changes to the MFA auth and config logic in the SHIB IDP, and maybe more significant changes to the, the auth and context class refs that you have associated with SPs and the relying party override file. Um, you don't have to worry about any of that with NIH asking for refeds MFA. Because the IDP will just, the IDP essentially is written to do the right thing and, and um, uh, with that. And unless you've, you've made more changes to the MFA logic than normal in the IDP, the IDP, it, you know, and you've only associated refeds MFA like with Duo, then there's, there's no way the IDP is going to be willing to respond back to the service with a successful SAML response unless it thinks that person has done duo. So uh, you, you, don't, you don't get into as complex of logic for when, you know, that you need for when you want to drive the decision within the IDP as to when duo, duo has, or do, MFA has to happen. Good addition, Mike, thank you. The other thing I'll say about assurance, since we aren't getting any questions around MFA and we the one thing is is you could set up if you're not already releasing edge person assurance you could set that up in your IDP or CAS server or whatever and, and basically have the static there's a base value for it that basically says hey I'm starting to put in place the machinery for 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 asserting the assurance attribute and there's this base value for that in common list that basically says, I support sending the attribute, but I'm not telling you any, I, I don't know anything about the assurance level of this individual at the moment. Um, so you can put in place the machinery for, for releasing the attribute and give it that base value, even defining it as a static attribute value, you know, kind of hard coded in the IDP to send for now until you have the business processes in place to decide that, or you, you've had the time to vet your business processes to decide, you know, for whom you can have, you know, assert additional values that actually say something, you know, uh, more about the assurance level of the individual. Uh, so that's, that's one thing you could do now is to put in that, you know, that core just base level of, of asserting that kind of hard coded value that says, hey, we support giving you an attribute, but we, we, we don't yet um, have a richer set of values to give. Thanks, Mike. Okay, as mentioned, this recording will be on the Unicon website, unicon.net. Um, so you'll have all this information to share maybe with your other team members or obviously with others that were not able to make it today. Please watch for additional communications to come your way about the next requirements for NIH as well as possibly other uh, government branches that might have needs that affect higher education. So thank you very much for joining us. Have a wonderful weekend.